Hi everybody and welcome to today's ODI Friday's talk. I'm Hannah Folds, Head of Marketing and Production at the ODI and it's my real pleasure this afternoon to welcome Sharon Richardson, Senior Scientist in Geocomputation at the University of Zurich. Now can a machine really learn about and infer emotions from digitized behavior? And how does it compare with human performance? How well do we understand how emotions are expressed and why? In this talk, Sharon will look at the theories and algorithms and the benefits and consequences of the application in real world situations. Uh, just so you're all aware, this, today's talk will be recorded. Uh, so if you're in the audience, please turn your mics and cameras off. And if you have any questions for Sharon, please wait till the very end um, and um, post them in the chat and I'll call you out to either um, ask the question yourselves or let me know if you'd like me to do it on your behalf. Um, over to you, Sharon. Thanks very much. I'll just share my screen. Oh, Hannah, you might just need to switch your screen share off. Okay, I'm guessing everyone can see my slides. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much to the Open Data Institute for inviting me to this talk today, uh, and I'm just gonna dive straight in here. Can an AI detect emotion? I'm gonna talk for around about the next 20, 25 minutes. So I'm gonna focus on, well, can it or can't it? Because uh, I'm guessing the discussion and questions might be where we dig into some of more of the real world applications in a bit more detail. But I'm gonna start off with um, an interesting creature here. I'm gonna say what it is because I put it on the slide because it's quite hard to pronounce. So it's a Marma Krebs Precambrous Phallax Former Virginalis, a um, bit of a mouthful. And it was first discovered in an aquarium, not the wild, in an aquarium in, the, in Germany in the 1990s. And it spontaneously produces eggs, which means its offspring are clones of its parents. And all of this particular breed of marmot crab are female. There's no male of this. No other crayfish or species, similar species does anything like this. And we don't really know why. This, is, this story is taken from the book uh, in the top right corner. Yeah by uh, Michael Blastland, and it's really exploring the data we don't know about the real world. And it leads on to this quote by uh, the rather well-known author Aldous Huxley from 1932. Man is so intelligent that he feels impelled to invent theories to account for what happens in the world. Unfortunately, he is not quite intelligent enough in most cases to find correct explanations so that when he acts on his theories, he behaves very often like a lunatic. So it's a bit of a harsh quote, but it's a good sort of establishing where are we at when it comes to detecting emotion, because we're often relying on theories we're inventing to try and make sense of the world. And this story broke uh, into news headlines and went viral just a couple of weeks ago. So some of you may be familiar with it, but Canon in China are using AI cameras that will only let you into the offices or a meeting room if you smile. Um, because of course, uh, a, a, a smiling, a, a workplace full of smiling people is a happy workplace, isn't it? There's <laughs> what could possibly go wrong. And so there's been understandably quite an uproar about this because you know there's obviously some very flawed thinking behind that strategy, but they are by no means the first who've been doing this or still be doing this. You know, back in 2018, Wired and others covered the fact that many call centers use voice analysis software now to detect mood and emotions in both customers and agents' voices and kindly provide motivational suggestions for how to handle this person based on the tone of their voice. Academia, we play our part too. There's been a lot of research where we've used social media that's geo-referenced to try and get a better understanding of place. And in my background in geocomputation, you can see that's where a lot of my research is focused on. And this is just one example using Foursquare check-ins and Yelp reviews, and then analyzing the profile pictures of the people who frequent them to try and understand, well, what's the ambience of the place going to be like based on the people who leave reviews about it. And it's not just images. You know, if you write anything down in text, then we can start analyzing the text and doing sentiment analysis and emotion detection. So Facebook posts have been used for this, but Twitter also has been a minefield for detecting how do people feel about things going on in the real world. And we go beyond text as well, into playing games. A lot of this was made very famous through the reveals of Cambridge Analytica 
a few years ago, which used surveys and games and all sorts to elicit information that could be used to profile people. But again, we use it to understand how people navigate space and how they feel about their urban environments by getting them to engage in gameplay. These are all forms of trying to get an understanding of emotions and feelings about the real world and situations that occur within it. Now, we wrap all of this up into this phrase, effective computing. There's a term coined by Rosalind Picard back in 1995 to say it's computing that relates to, arises from, or influences emotion. You know, but obviously, this subject's much older than that, but this was very much when this phrase came into being. And Picard had this idea of the different levels to which a computer could start to perform in this way. So a computer can express effect and or recognize effect. And so if it can't do either, so it can't express and it can't recognize any effect, it's mindless. It's got no effective capability whatsoever. So let's call that level zero. If it can express effect, but can't recognize it in people, well, then it's just doing impersonation. And this is arguably the oldest style that we've used computers for. I think perhaps my earliest recollection of a robot acting in some kind of emotional way is sort of the, the rocking that R2-D2 would do to make it look like it's excited in Star Wars. You know, we do it a lot with robots. We can anthropomorphize anything, even a, I think it was a basketball in the film uh, Cast Away when Tom, uh, Tom Hanks was stranded on an island and it's like, Wilson, with a hand on the ball. You know, we can, we can infer emotion or have a conversation with just about any inanimate object, but it doesn't, it doesn't react back well with us. So that then moves us up to the next level, level two, where it starts to become an evaluator. And this is the idea that we can start to use computers to evaluate our emotions, but we don't express anything back. So the machine is just detecting. And many of the research examples that, you know, just on the previous slides, you could argue that's what most of them are doing. They're actually evaluating the emotional response of people, but they're not actually then doing it to infer anything. But if we go up to level three, does a machine then become mindful? And if it's mindful, is it potentially a manipulator? Because now it can both recognize effect and express effect. And that can be a two-way empathetic relationship potentially. Uh, do we have much of that today? I would argue not, but I'm happy to be proven wrong because it's a field that's growing very, very rapidly over the past decade. But bearing in mind on this definition, this is what we're looking about when we're thinking about can an AI detect emotion? And so how we go about that? Well, it, it kind of involves an assumption. And that is that at least some emotions are truly universal because how else are we going to detect them across any possible person in the world? And a lot of the foundations for computer vision algorithms, for example, come from the research of psychologist Paul Ekman. And he invented this facial action coding system, FACS, which is the underpinning for a lot of emotion detection in imagery. And it was based on this theory that joy, anger, fear, and sadness contain one or more muscular actions that most people cannot perform deliberately. By most people, that excludes, it seems, all actors, because actors were then made to perform these expressions in order to conduct research. And one such image is there on the right of the slide. But this became the underpinnings for how we start to try and detect emotions, that there's some universality that can be extracted from digital images. So how do we go about computing emotion? It's quite a noisy slide, so we're just gonna step through it from left to right. So I've got a couple of simple examples on the left. I've got a face shot of a former colleague at University College London, a good friend, and a tweet that's nicely ambiguous when it comes to trying to figure out its emotion. Had a lovely time yesterday at West Ham's new ground with my daughter. West Ham were rubbish, didn't really matter. You know, so a bit of up, bit of down, how would we judge that? And when it comes to using computers, using, a, and I'm doing quite a gross simplification here because we're not going to go into the whole world of machine learning, but there are, at its simplest, three approaches. We can take a rules-based learning approach, we can take a classic machine learning approach, and we can take a reinforcement machine learning approach. So the rules-based approach is we tell the computer what to look for. And this is where things such as that facial action coding system comes in. We say, right, well, look for certain muscles, certain facial attributes, measure the angles. And we're going to tell you that if they're in these positions, this is what we think the emotion is. And if they're in those positions, we think it's something else. And we can apply this to text as well through dictionaries. And this is a very, very oversimplified example here, but we can start to figure out, well, what are positive words? What are negative words? We can attribute scores to them and then come up with some scoring system. But we're telling the computer, this is what we think. And then, okay, here's, a sample. here's the thing that I want to test. 
apply the rules and come up with an answer. When we go to classic machine learning, we give the computer some examples. Instead of stating all the rules, we say, well, here's some examples. You figure out what the rules are and then apply them to the piece of data that I want classified. And that further separates out into what we call supervised and unsupervised learning. So if it's supervised, we give a computer some examples, but we pre-label it with categories. And so the computer can analyze the different buckets of categories of data, figure out what the differences are between the categories, what are the similarities within the categories, but it figures out. So it doesn't need to be told where the muscles should be in the face. It figures out based on the samples that we've given it. And then it will produce a score for new data that we want classified. Well, we go the step further and we actually don't put any of our potential biases into the labeling process and just give it the data. Unsupervised, we call this, where there's no labeling and leave the computer just analyze it and say, well, tell us, are there, are there categories in there? Are there clusters of images or text sound bites that seem to have similarities and give us those clusters or then tell us out of that cluster, which one does our new sample apply to? So that's going down the more classic machine learning. The third level is the reinforcement machine learning. And this is where we set the computer a goal, preferably and usually with some constraints, but instead of giving it examples, we let it loose to figure things out from itself. Uh, and there's two ways, the more mature way and perhaps the more successful applications of this approach so far has been when the computer simulates, it plays games, it simulates over and over and over and over and over and over again, with lots and lots of different scenarios to figure out the optimal way to achieve the goal. And we've seen this with the breakthroughs with Google's DeepMind and the different iterations of the alphas, you know, from AlphaGo up to whichever the latest one was to capture the flag. It's given a goal, but it learns, it, it teaches itself. So it creates its own data in that environment. But when we apply it in the real world, it doesn't go so well. Um, so Microsoft released a chat bot uh, a few years ago and within 24 hours had to take it down again because it, it just went, it just consumed everything on Twitter uh, and started to respond and engage. And within 24 hours, it was not a very nice chat bot and was taken offline, not helped by people picking up on what was going on and further goading it into even more vile and abusive language. So reinforcement learning is, I would argue, is actually the most powerful area of artificial intelligence and where we're likely to see the biggest breakthroughs, but it's also potentially where there's the biggest challenges and consequences, and it's not an area that's being used yet, really, in emotion detection. But we then need to think about, well, how does it really, really work? Because we tend to forget that we can we've, we've now got to the point with computer vision algorithms that they can even outperform humans in object detection. It doesn't mean they see images the same way as us. And this is just one example. There's been a few different examples where the, the machine learning's not proven to do what we thought it was doing. So here, when dermatologists are looking at a lesion they think might be a tumor, they'll break out a ruler to take an accurate measurement of its size. And if images had a ruler in it, the algorithm was more likely to call a tumor malignant. And that was simply because that ruler was noise in the image, but it was consistent noise on certain images. And so it became part of the classifier when the machine was left to learn for itself. It would picked up the patterns for what is a ruler and a ruler and, an, and a labeled thing that says this is cancerous. Well, the ruler becomes more important than the tumor potentially. And that's how easy it is to go wrong when we're building these algorithms. Other examples included uh, one, I think if I remember correctly, where it was classifying breeds of dog and all the training set. For huskies, there was snow in the background. And so therefore, if you had presented a picture of a husky that didn't have snow in the background, it was never gonna pick up that it might be a husky because it was the snow that was the dominant feature, the dominant predictor for what the breed of dog was. So we can very easily trip up our algorithms. But even when there's not noise in the, the image, the images themselves can be very ambiguous. Now, what emotion is this? Is it anger? Is it disgust? Is it fear? Pain? We are not really can tend to include pain as, as an expression. Is it joy? Is it sadness? You know, it's, it kind of doesn't, I mean, if somebody did that to you right in your face, would you be very happy about it? Maybe, maybe not. But then if we step back to the full picture, now what do we think? And you know, it's not absolutely certain. We could say it, it's elation. It's potentially he's just won a very hard fought point in the game. And it's that release of tension. Yes, I did it. And that his friends coming up to high five, you know, and off they go again. It, but it could be he's just had his point disallowed and he's actually 
mad. <laughs> I mean, it's just, and the friend's actually leaning forward to say, forget it, move on, we've got to focus on the match. It's possible. It's actually quite hard for us as humans without more information. We actually need the video clip to really know what the emotion is here. And then there's the whole issue of, well, does everybody have the same emotion? You know, this concept is, is it truly universal? Now I'm gonna try and play this clip because it's a, just a great example that we all have different resting places when we're not really concentrating on communicating to somebody else, when we're just thinking about stuff. Some people have a naturally lifted resting face. Alas, I am not one. And I try to smile most of the time, but if I'm concentrating, somebody will often say, gosh, you're frowning. It's like, oh, no, I was just, I was deep in thought. So let me just play this clip. It's a resting it's face I was born with. And, uh, you know, I, I, built, I built a career around it, so it's awesome. So right now, <laughs> right now you look kind of twinkly. Well, because I'm smiling. Yeah, yeah but so, when I'm just thinking about like, hey, that is a really amazing looking suit. <laughs> it looks like I might want to hurt you, right? <laughs> but I'm thinking like, oh my God, it's a, it's a beautiful suit. But, yeah. but if I'm, you know, if I'm just thinking about it, it looks like I'm, I might want to choke you. <laughs> Yes, I see it. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, this is it. It's just context and background are completely intertwined with our visual expressions. But what about text and language? In many respects, it's a similar challenge. This is a study here on the left hand side by Safatar from 2019 that used traditional sentiment based dictionaries, so dictionaries that score all the different words of the language. Uh, for positive, neutral, negative, and for various types of emotion categories, there's various dictionaries established in psychological research and found that using these dictionaries, African Americans are up to two times more likely to be labeled as offensive compared to others. Why is that? Because perhaps the dictionaries are not representative of everybody. They're, when we say natural language processing, we're saying natural based on the set of data that we're using to build up the dictionaries or to build up the training algorithms. And the more sort of flippant example of this here on the right hand side, uh, and again, I've got links to everything on the slide so you can follow through on any of these for more detail, but the classic, what did the British say and what they actually mean? And it's like, yeah, with the greatest respect, I think you're an idiot, is often what well, some people might be thinking in the background. But some of the emotion ones are spectacular. It's like, mm, that's not bad. Generally means it's pretty good if we're saying it. If somebody else says it, it might be totally different. And then, but then there's the classic, it's like, yeah, it's quite good. Um, this is not the response you perhaps want, but yeah, it's quite good. It's a better response and we haven't changed the words. And so these are huge challenges for us to try and get a better understanding of context when we're detecting emotion. So again, what emotion is this? Loving the badass atmosphere here. Is that anger? Is it disgust? Is it fear, joy, or sadness? These are the common categories that we use with text uh, and emotion detection. Just pause for a moment, you know, think, what would you classify it as? What percentage would you assign any or all of these five terms? And so well, this is what IBM Watson came up with, tone analyzer. And I ran this in September, 2019, so it's entirely possible it would come up with a totally different response today if it's been tuned. But it came up with 52% sadness and 36% joy, which is kind of sitting on the fence, in my opinion. Um, and perhaps that's because the algorithm needs a sixth category. I don't know, <laughs> because sometimes we don't know. You know, why do we have to come up with either a neutral or something? We can be clear and say this is just not an emotion that we can figure out. There's just too much ambiguity or uncertainty in the data that I'm facing here to make any realistic judgment at all. But that's often not how these algorithms are presenting results, particularly in a lot of the play apps that we see out there that do sentiment analysis. They give you these numbers and you work from them and it's wrong. You know, we need to be able to say, I don't know for the machine just as much as a human being would. But that leads me on nicely too. Well, what about us? Are humans better at emotion detection? And this has been where it started to get very interesting. So this book, How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett, has really looked into this kind of assumption that emotions are universal, at least some of them are universal, because it turns out an awful lot of the experiments that established foundations for emotion research involved some amount of priming or context in order to get to elicit responses from participants. So they've been rerunning a lot of these experiments all over again and seeing what happens. So on this image, on this slide rather, on the left-hand side, the subjects were given a context and then sometimes 
given a photo, not always. So he just witnessed a shooting on his quiet tree shaded block in Brooklyn. What do you think the expression is? And 66% rated emotion would be fear. But this was with and without a photo. So whether or not you showed people a photo, they came up with pretty much the same percentage of the emotion because it's what they were feeling. I assume, I assume, you know, it's like if somebody gave me that profile, I think, well, I'd be a bit scared. So that's, I'm thinking that's the emotion I'd feel, no matter what face I'm presented with. And it's been re reproduced in numerous different studies. No context at all if you just give people the exact same photo. And I must emphasize, this is not the photo that was given in these tests. This is just one for example. But with no context, 38% rated the same photo as fear. 56%, however, rated it as surprise. So without any context to lead in a direction, it looks more like a surprising face. And it's like our frowns. Our frowns can be thoughtful. They can be contemplative. They can be sad. They can be joy. You know, you can feel happiness without necessarily smiling. And this is the challenge with emotion detection. The other challenge, and it's a biggie, is, well, what is an emotion? We bandy the word around as if it's an established thing. And actually, this research by Carol Izzard in 2010, and I have taken the quote straight from the paper, there is still no consensus on a definition of emotion. And theorists and researchers use emotion in ways that reflect very different meanings and functions. And that links through to this image on the right hand side, which is adapted from Hilgard, this concept that actually when we think about the mind is a trilogy. It's not just cognition. It's not just effect. And there's also this third angle that's talked about even less, which is conation. You know, it's like our cognition is our perceiving, our thinking, our intellect. And an awful lot of AI research is focused on the cognitive angle. But there's that recognition that effect covers our emotions, our feelings, and our mood. And there's an interplay between these things. You know, what we perceive may turn, will influence what we feel. What we feel may influence what we perceive. But then connection comes into it. You know, your motivation for being in a certain place is going to affect how you react to events in that place and how you feel about them. And our own temperament comes in. I remember reading research um, some time ago, and it's not my field of expertise, that had said that research was indicating about one in seven cats is born with a naturally nervous disposition and they were curious to see whether this applies across other species and because there was and the general belief was they did some tests with children and the numbers were broadly similar that if you actually evaluated you would get a, a level of visible nervousness in about one in seven children so it's interesting but that's a temperament so how do we bring that into the judgment because that doesn't mean somebody's feeling necessarily tense they can still be very excited it's just they are naturally more of an anxious personality somebody else completely laid back maybe as happy as anything but have a scowl on their face and so we haven't got that capability yet brought into how we detect emotion and it's not just that we can't define what emotions are but there are the, there's a growing recognition as to just how do we figure out the different levels of emotions so taking just one happiness and this is from the book happiness the science behind your smile it's a tiny book i put it back on my shelf it's literally small and it's a quick read and if you're interested in these things i'd recommend taking a look at it but daniel nettle defined this idea that there's at least and he said it could be more but this is just to give a broad indication three levels of happiness there's momentary feelings such as joy pleasure they don't last very long they're transient but they do tend to have a particular phenomenology, which can fit with a lot of the, the beliefs and opinions and theories of Paul Ekman, and that there are signatures that we can detect because there's physiological reactions. So that's back to the muscle movements as well. But the level two is actually where the feeling lasts longer. So this becomes judgment comes to play, and it's the feeling of well being or satisfaction. And so we start to get a bit reflective. And reflective means we also start to compare with alternative, but often recent outcomes. And Daniel Kahneman, who's done lots and lots of research on decisions and decision science, will talk about this as an example in one of his books, I think Thinking Fast and Slow, somebody attending a beautiful music concert, but then there was a terrible crash noise right at the end of the concert and their comment was, oh, it ruined the whole night. And it, like, it was something that lasted a few seconds in an hour and a half long performance. So if you broke it down rationally, you say, well, it kind of ruined the whole night. It was just it ruined the end, perhaps. Um, but what happens most recently tends to stick with us. And so level two is referred to as hedonics and or often subjective well-being. Level three is the trickiest because that's becomes more evaluative of quality of life. You know, are you flourishing? Are you reaching your potential? And moralistic judgments often start to come in here where we look to conform with cultural norms and values. And this is referred to as eudaimonics. And the thing is, there's no hard barriers between these. The level one to two is much more personal and psychological and inward-focused the self. 
But level two to three becomes more social and judgmental. So judgmental from the self, I'm evaluating myself, but also by others. It's like, oh, don't think you should behave like that. Oh, come on, smile, cheer up a bit. You know, you start to get others putting their judgments onto you. And this is a, a quote, which I think is very, very pertinent because we keep talking about emotion detection and scoring happiness in particular out of emotions. There's this quote coming from the book, although a janitor today is richer in real terms than a doctor of 30 years ago, he is still a janitor and still has as little choice about where, when, and what he does as he ever did. And a big part of that research is our feeling of well-being is having autonomy over our choices. And it's not just about smiling to get the door to unlock so that you can come in. So the limitations with computing emotion, big issues, and these are well covered in lots of examples in the news, certainly at the moment, bias in the training data that can influence how we build the algorithms. But just as important, if not more important, is bias in how the data is labeled for creating algorithms. And there's more awareness growing of that issue too, because often it's a specific demographic might be doing the labeling. And so it's their perspective on emotion. It's not necessarily a universal or a worldwide coverage of perspectives. There's a real issue of bias if the algorithms are applied to unrepresented data. And a classic example here is a cross sentiment analysis in particular, because a lot of the sentiment algorithms are trained on larger data sets or longer texts. And we then apply them to very short messages, which are written in a very, very different style and different grammar. And so it's not really represented by the algorithm. And so unsurprisingly, the algorithm struggles. Talked about far less, and I think it needs to be talked about more, a bias in the underlying theories. You know, are emotions universal and distinct? You know, do those muscle movements actually make sense? You know, or is it a same expression can be both joy and rage, depending on the context, but actually the muscles are in a similar position. You know, it's, it's not a solved problem. And finally, of course, the bias is in the interpretation too, both in the personal evaluation, but also external judgments, which is where some of the real world applications are quite concerning. But before I wrap up and open to more of a discussion, there is some good, <laughs> it's not all bad here. You know, what does work? And I would argue, and I'm happy to debate this because this is very much getting onto my personal opinion on this uh, field at the moment, is I think emotion heuristics work. Uh, and we see it in our use of emojis. I think we maybe have more options for the face than needed. I probably use about five off this list on the right hand side that I pulled out of my um, text messaging app just for the uh, conference talk. And I definitely don't use anything I've checked yet yeah, on the bottom three, I think. No, definitely the bottom two. And I've never used one of the ones on the bottom line. But we use them as heuristics to quickly communicate either in response to what somebody said because we think it's funny we like it we want to support them or to emphasize the message that we're trying to communicate and that's the thing it's when we're using these heuristics to help improve our communication and we are seeing some useful applications in the ai in this space so grammarly is a tool that can analyze your text and make suggestions on your grammar and other things and one aspect it's got is tone and whilst it might not get it right, I think it's nice to have that assistive option where I'm writing something and I get some more feedback that says, oh, well, I think you're a bit formal or I think mm, it's a bit blunt or it's a bit negative. You know, I don't have to agree with it, but it's quite useful to have that feedback. And then I can decide for myself whether I want to embrace it and change or whether actually it's like, no, no, I think you've misunderstood what I'm saying here. And this is because it's it starts to get into this reality of how we experience feelings and how we use them and it doesn't always just have to be happy happy smiles and this is a quote from sources of power it's just one of my favorite books it's getting an old now it's long in the tooth but it's still it's as, as good a read today as it was at the time on how people make decisions and they tested flight crews to see how they would cope with malfunctions and, and how they would work as a team. So they're asked to play eight hour missions in a simulator and the expectation is they would perform better in high stress malfunctioning situations when they were fresh at the start of the eight hours than at the end when they were all a bit tired, a bit frazzled, a bit grumpy, a bit wanting to finish it, get out of the simulator, but had enough. And the results were the complete opposite. The crew members did far better at the end of their missions because they'd learned how to work together. They'd learned how to anticipate each other's reactions. They became adept at ha having this perception of being able to read each other's minds. And that includes having empathy and spotting when somebody's frowning, is it their resting face and it's okay? Or it's like, oh, if they're frowning, there's a problem and knowing. And you only get that by experience and context and time. And that's 
is one of the big challenges we face with trying to automate detection of emotion. So to wrap up, can an AI or a human for that matter, detect emotion? And it's really summarizes, we have no robust de definitions for emotion. And that matters because we're building artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms on top of a base of research that itself is shifting. There's huge gains and movement in the fields of neuroscience and psychology to try and improve our understandings of how emotions work and how they interact with cognition and inclination. Algorithms are suspect, susceptible to flawed data. I think most people would agree that, but also flawed theories, and that's problematic. Beyond physiological responses, inference is highly subjective, and experiences and judgments are heavily influenced by context. But universal heuristics can assist communication and well being. And I think that for me is where I would like to see AI and emotional AI going. Those level two, three affected computing possibilities, if they assist the person, I think that can be very for good. But when they judge or manipulate, that is where I get concerned in terms of real world situations. So I put in some references here because I'm happy to share the slides afterwards. I'll skip that because there's some really good reading sources here. If you want the freshest, most recent research, I have to do a quick plug for the latest book coming out from Hannah Fry and Adam Rutherford, which is Rutherford and Fry's complete guide to absolutely everything abridged because it's, you know, it's not a complete tome. Uh, but it's also got a section that covers a lot of what we've talked about today, partly because I've been involved in the research for the book. And with that, I will say thank you because I think I've talked for far enough uh, and to allow some time for questions. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, that was such an interesting talk. Um, I'm particularly terrified by the idea of having to show joy before walking into a meeting room. Uh, I think I'm going to have nightmares about that. Um, over to the audience now for questions. Um, if you could, oh, I can see there's some in the chat already, so thank you very much. If you've got any more to add, please do so now. Um, I'm going to kick off with my own question. Do you see any situation where there might be a positive societal outcome to AI recognising emotion? So it's a really, really good question because there is research being done, for example, and I've been very mixed. I've, I've got a yo-yo between thinking it's bad to it's good. Um, but there's research being done to help autistic children better understand emotions in faces presented to them, because there is a recognition that people on the autistic spectrum may struggle to read emotions. And I sometimes wonder, I'm, I can be myself, I'm not always the greatest at reading people, and sometimes something can go straight over my head and they have to like, ah, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> sometimes I think, you know, that on a weekend, maybe I'm equally applicable to that. So I think there's, there's definitely benefit if it can help people understand and see because it's back to that assisting communication my reservation with it is that shouldn't we also be more embracing that not everyone communicates in the same way or understands the emotion in the same way so I, that's where I get hesitant because I don't, I don't like the idea of trying to normalize us all into this narrow band where we've all got the same smile I mean I always remember I, it's terrible because she's in the news again at the moment but Britney Spears I remember reading an article years ago about how they took her to a dentist when she was a very young child to get the teeth set and then they took into how to have this perfect symmetrical smile because that's very photogenic. I have a wonky mouth. I can see it when I'm talking. It drives me slightly crazy. Um, I don't want to be normalized though. So, so on the one hand, I think, and this is, it's back to that. I would love to have the little, that you see it in sci-fi films, the computer in your ear that's helping you. Um, and so you can choose whether to take the advice or ignore it, but it's helping you. And so I think that's where I think there's definitely potential to help assist people spot the things that we might otherwise miss because we just didn't pick up the signals. But it's, it's, it's a sensitive area because I'm also concerned that I think we should be embracing that not everybody gets things the same way. And that's a good thing. That's what makes life interesting and diverse. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so our first question is from Alistair, who is our former artist in residence at the ODI. Nice to have you back, Alistair. Would you like to ask a question yourself? Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, I, my question was, is there any, are you aware of any research looking at how adept humans are at lying, irony, performing emotions they don't feel, and feeling contradictory emotions simultaneously? Or is that just too much, given what you've said about how tough it is to even get the basics right right now 
Yeah, I mean, this is, I can't name any off the top of my head, but I don't doubt there's plenty going on. In the same way, there's a lot, there's a huge movement at the moment in trying to be able to decide to detect fake anything in images, video and text. So being able to try and tease out, is this real or not? Um, so the interesting thing with the Ekman's you know, approach with the facial action coding system is he said that most people could not artificially fake a smile, for example, and then yet promptly employed lots of unknown actors to fake smiles. And so it's like, well, okay, so it means that you can be trained into doing it. So it's, it's again, it's, I think there are people trying to do this, but it's back to that issue of what is, you know, beyond the really simplistic smile categories, there's a whole wealth in between. So I think what we need to have is that, how confident are we that this is a smile? And it doesn't mean it's not just because we aren't confident enough because yeah, it's, it is at the moment. I think there's research, but I'm not sure they'll have more luck going for the reverse, the inverse, the lying and the fake versions of emotions if we can't get the real ones either. Uh, yeah, I just, I just think this goes back to the thing you were saying about the, the, the need for more nuance in the discussions around this, you know, it's like, as you say, you know, they say that only actors can do it, but I'm a performance artist, I perform emotions I don't feel all the time, you know, it's like, I'm not an actor, and we do as human beings as well. No, and absolutely. Be, I'm yeah. a great believer, you know, I tend to smile a lot because I find it lifts me. Um, because I know, and I also know I've got, I've got a resting face similar to Jeremy Renner, uh, you know, so, but I'm aware of it. And so I tend to, I mean, it's like now I am, um, but I walk along the street too. I don't have to be with anyone. I've generally got music in my ears and I smile and I smile at strangers because I find it makes me feel, I get a feeling out of it. And I think it generally makes the world a little bit of a nicer place. So it's, um, so, but I, I do that regardless of what my inner mood is. And sometimes even when I'm feeling a bit of glum, I'll smile to people because I feel it start to lift my spirit. So arguably I'm faking it to make it. And so, you know, using the old cliched quote. And again, and I'm certainly not trained as an actor at all. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Really interesting talk, by the way. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Thanks, Alistair. Okay, we've got a question from uh, David Black. Would you like to read out your own question? Yes, hello. Hey. Hello. Um, let me just bring the question up. Yeah, I was just trying to quickly scan through it myself. Uh, yeah, so I'm doing an ad hoc citizen experiment on my own. I've got two Twitter accounts, one in my name and one a campaigning group name. I'm more positive on one, more negative on the other, and frequently like the tweets from each of the other accounts. Could AI detect that both accounts are emanating from the same human brain? It's not so much that it could detect it, but if it was targeted to look for it, it would probably pick up. You would probably score strongly. It depends. So for, it would be the pattern. If it's predominantly these two accounts are liking each other and I'm not seeing other accounts that like you or and do the reverse, then there's an anomaly. So it would probably pick up that this is this looks like an anomaly, and that would raise a question mark. And the question mark would then be: is one of the, is these bots that are deliberately boosting each other's account, for example? So so it wouldn't necessarily have a trigger that would automatically pick it up, but it would probably start to raise a flag that this looks like an anomalous behaviour, and that would then raise the question mark. That's, that's what would be really interesting is if you are literally more positive on one and more negative than the other, it would be fascinating to analyse whether there's an impact on the engagement levels and the types of promotions and Yes, be get. because I follow the same people and I find I'm advised to follow the same people from one to the other. Uh, so people keep popping up and I follow across a whole wide section of um, um, the world, if you like. And they do keep you, popping up. Do you run both accounts off the same computer? Yes. So yeah, Twitter's probably got you tagged anywhere on your IP address. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very interesting talk. I do the smiling all the time. Good. And I do some videos for um, as a citizen for hospitals. And I do the thing where I talk out the corner of my mouth, which I think looks terrible, but it's me face. I can't do anything about no, it. No, it's, there's a muscle, isn't there? It's, it's a very common one. You see it in a lot of people and I've got it too. My brother has as well. So it's a genetic, effectively, it's a genetic fault. Yeah. You've reassured me so much. I'll not worry about what I look like now. <laughs> yeah. Thank Great. you. Thank you. 
Oh, we're all in this together, David, don't worry. <laughs> um, with, our, with our presentation faces on. And we've got Stephanie next. Stephanie, would you like to, to read your question out? Hi, yeah. Oh, thank you, that was great, really great. Um, so I had actually two questions. Um, I was wondering if you're aware of any research into detecting emotions in animals? So yeah, um, the Rutherford and Fry book <laughs> has, addresses this. And in fact, if you, they'll be, do, they're doing a tour and they'll be doing videos and all sorts, because there has been the whole, does your dog love you? Um, and there's been extensive. So Adam Rutherford's got a lot of opinions on this. So if you're familiar with his work, I would suggest look up Adam Rutherford, look up the curious cases of Rutherford and Fry, because they have talked about the, uh, the research of detecting or anthropomorphizing emotions in animals, so yeah. Great, yeah, because there's sort of, there is evidence to suggest that dogs have evolved, you know, domestic dogs have evolved their facial expression. Exactly, it's around their eyes, the fact that their eyes are big and the, and the, the sort of the wrinkles and everything around is that they, there's a belief that, yeah, that has evolved in order to have a level of communication almost with humans, but we're still having to make an awful lot of judgments about is that truly the case so but but yeah so there is interest there's a really interesting work but adam rutherford knows more about this than me um so he'd be a good good one person to look up and see his opinions on that um because i i was i uh, worked with horses i was passionate about horses for a long time and so and you could i could tell their moods um i used to compete and i had a mare and i could pretty much take her out the stable in the morning and tell you how well we were going to do at the show because <laughs> there's just the body language not good it's like oh should we even bother going it's like should we just go and hack <laughs> other days aren't oh, we good so they definitely they have temperaments as well um but we do have to also be careful how much we infer of our range but yeah i am more i'm leaning towards that i think they have temperaments and feelings than not but it's a controversial subject Thank you. Um, so my other question, uh, maybe just as odd, um, are you aware of anyone working on coding emotion um, into AIs rather than detecting emotion? So literally making the AI have an emotional response? Yeah. Uh, certainly not in terms of, and I'm happy if anyone else has heard of anything to correct me, but not in terms of real world applications. There's certainly been gameplay and so in, syn in synthetic environments, seeing what that happens in a game, you can argue we so often think about what we've seen in the sci-fi films and anyone who watched Star Trek or The Next Generation with Data at one point got given an emotion chip and was like, oh, I can't make decisions. It's like, and it's, it, which is really interesting because it was, it was based on the belief that emotion disrupts decision-making. And of course now research has matured a bit and has acknowledged we don't make decisions without emotion. And in fact, there's neuroscience and research been done where patients unable to feel, express emotions are completely unable to make decisions. They can't decide. Um, you have, there's that instant, there's that appearance that there's a gut spill somewhere that when presented with a range of options that are quite comparable, if you haven't got an emotional foot in it, you can't decide. And literally they, they, can, they, they just physically cannot make a decision. So emotion and decision-making, uh, the acknowledgement now is they are inherently twined. Whereas for a long time, the, the belief was that emotions disrupted and weakened our decision-making ability. Now there's an acknowledgement, now it strengthens. So it's um, fascinating. So how we then bake that into an AI is um, all bets are off. You know, it, it becomes a very philosophical debate. At what point do we allow an AI to behave more like uh, a human or an organism than a machine? I was at a, 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 an event, a workshop, where we were talking about AI and AI procurement. And this came up as an example. Instead of thinking of procuring a system should we be recruiting an AI should we treat it like a recruitment process and I thought that was a fascinating insight because it completely changes how you look at the AI and how you think about evaluating its role within the organization if you're recruiting it rather than just buying what feels like a, a sterile you know lump of machinery yeah definitely oh, thanks very much you're welcome thanks Stephanie um I'm probably not going to read that because I uh, that that um a uh, piece on, on uh, animal emotions because I'm ignorantly hoping that my dog loves me. Oh, um, I will be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sue, Sue Chadwick, who did a talk uh, last week or a few weeks ago yourself, uh, could you read your question out? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, I'm not showing my face because I'm just back from the dentist and nobody wants to see my <laughs> resting face right now. Um, 
but I was really enjoyed really enjoying this Sharon and I don't know if you saw there was an opinion this week on live facial recognition from the ICO which freaked me out because I thought I knew what what they were doing um, but evidently that she was talking about LFR enabled billboards that can read clothes and all sorts of things and then pass that information across now all the all the ICO can do is recommend a data protection impact assessment and this I know there's no simple answer to this but can you or anybody here think of better ways of more rounded ways of assessing impacts of this quite scary technology that's actually out there already and being used really really good question so i just i was just able to read through it as on the side so yeah um it was actually embedded into the billboards at piccadilly circus um back in about 2017 it would do emotion detection and gender detection and so it, with the view of being able to change the advert based on who's currently walking in front of the screen uh, which i find hugely offensive because i'm not a fan of genders what they think as a woman I'd like to see versus what I'm actually interested in if I'm about to buy a watch or computer or something I don't need to be told to go and buy a skirt or a pair of shoes um so yeah that embedded technology is everywhere and it's it's a really really good question because the harsh reality is not easily at the moment because the technology is so small and cheap I mean the really advanced stuff isn't you know it's a bit like um the sensors we get in our phones they're all obviously very very low cost sensors so if you're doing things like uh one of the projects i did within london within the olympic park well actually colleagues were more involved with it than me uh, was sensing bats using uh, a small uh, edison board with a high powered microphone to get the echo location call and then we had a little machine learning algorithm so it could tell us what species of bat was in what areas and it's a way of understanding the ecology of the park and how it was impacted by all the developments going on around it um, but yeah, tiny things, and who knows they're even out there, you know, because that required a high powered microphone, but the technology gets cheaper and cheaper. Um, and with you'll hear much more now about inference at the edge where we're putting these algorithms into like, you know, 10 pound, tiny, tiny little computers that can be deployed all over the place. So how do you detect them beyond the emitting an electrical signal? Uh, and maybe that's what's going to go. It's almost going to be like the... Uh, the gamma, is it gamma detector, you know, the one that can detect radiation? It's almost like, do we need that built into our phone so we can pick up when we're being sensed by others' sensors? Yeah, um, and how on earth can anybody guarantee consent when it's everywhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, it's interesting with the EU, and I know it's it's contentious for the UK, and I'm over here in, I'm over in Zurich at the moment, so we've got the Swexit conversation going on at the moment, which is equally <laughs> joyful. Um, but you know, the EUs are updating their AI framework. And I know the Office for AI as well as also looking at this, you know, to start thinking about these, but there are no solutions at the moment. Mm. And, and the AI regulation puts um, facial recognition right up there as high risk, which I think is right. Mm. But the emerging AI strategy and all the stuff coming out of government does not mention facial recognition at all. And what's is... really frustrating too is we've all had it, haven't we? That you've met, you've, you've either met your doppelganger or you've seen a doppelganger. You've seen <laughs> somebody that looks the spitting image. And I think there was, wasn't there that guy that was shoplifting somewhere and he looked just like David Schwimmer, the guy out of Friends. I mean, there was like the spitting image of. Um, and, so, and, and this has been one of the big issues when the police has used this facial mm. recognition because what it doesn't seem to be telling them in order to perhaps be a little bit less rough when they stop someone is say, okay, well, we're getting a match, but realistically our confidence of this is 20% at most, uh, as opposed to a high confidence, you know, because there, there's so, so many wrong matches. Mm. But those people, I mean, there was the, the man in America who got matched on facial recognition, ended up six months in prison, um, lost his job, lost his family, lost his home, you mm -hmm. know, and in the end, they finally acknowledged that he wasn't the guy. And it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. but you've ruined his life. <laughs> so it's just, so it's acknowledging that these tools are not flawless, you know, that they, mm -hmm. they might give you an indication, but start with the innocent until guilty assumption should hold true the machine says this is the person we're looking for but let's assume we're wrong first and work from that base as opposed to what seems to be happening which is well if the machine says it it's a machine machines are more reliable than humans so we'll believe it uh, i think that's a real issue with algorithms at the moment mm -hmm. brilliant thank you you're welcome thanks Sue. um we've got time for a couple more questions i think so uh, Maggie, would you like to ask yours? 
Um, yes, hi. Thanks for all this. It's really interesting. Um, so yeah, I was wondering, do you know if anyone's training AIs on emotional response through triggers other than words or facial recognition? Like, um, I don't know, gesture, stuff in things like move, dance, movement or colour. I don't know, yeah, stuff that's more... Um, uh, abstract in a way, I suppose. I don't know if it is abstract. Yeah, it's certainly, I mean, there's certainly gesture recognition, but I haven't seen anything that actually is linking the gesture recognition directly to emotions. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, I haven't looked to be fair. So again, if anyone does come across it and I'm gonna remember this one and have a quick look afterwards because I don't doubt that someone's gone, oh, you know, if we can get a pointing gesture, are we then gonna attach that to somebody being aggressive or direct or, you know, dominating uh, versus somebody doing this? And I always remember years ago that reading somewhere that the politicians, I think it started with Tony Blair, were told not to point. And so they'd all start doing this and you still see it today, you know, and it's all, thumb, I really want to do that, but I'm going to go mm, instead. You know, it's just hilarious. Um, so it, I don't know, it's not something I've looked for, uh, but I do know there's plenty of work around gesture recognition, also partly because they're doing, just as you saw with that image with the points around the face, so eyes, nose, mouth, and all the different muscles. The same is being done on the knuckles and the fingers, uh, but they're being done for things like sign language. So there's a lot of playing around with can we create gloves so that they can do sign language and translate it in, in real time as a person signing. So that's all dependent on very detailed gesture recognition. But I haven't seen, I haven't actually looked to whether or not someone's actually then gone a next step up and said, okay, we're gonna say these gestures would indicate these sorts of emotions and that carrying on into, for example, dance and movement. Um, so, it need, so does it need to be always very um, direct detail? Like it, it, it doesn't work if something's nuanced? Well, it's just gonna come out with a vague result. And this is the, one of the biggest issues with a lot of AI algorithms is they don't do a very good job of explaining what the confidence is in the result. You know, you tend to get the score and that's it. You don't get an awful lot more information such as how confident are we in this score? What's the range in this score? Um, there's a loss calculation to, to give us, a, a, to help improve that confidence. All this information is rarely presented. You just get, it's a bit like that tone analyzer. It's like, oh, 56%. And you know, as sadness, first six twenty joy. It's like, why didn't you just say I don't know? <laughs> you know, if it if it comes out that vague across two, you have no idea uh, what's going on. We don't have that coming through yet uh, with AI algorithms in general, and that is, I think, one of the problems. We're expecting a machine almost to be to a higher standard than we ask of ourselves. We're, we're quite tolerant if a person turns around and says, I just don't know. You know, I, I can make a call, but um, it's arbitrary. I'm making an arbitrary decision here. It could be, it could go either way. We're not yet comfortable at having a way of communicating. That's what all the AI is really telling us. So do you think just quickly, that's because of the way they're being trained? Well, it's just, it's, it's partly the fact that at the moment, it, we're starting to see the conversation. There needs to be, I think, more conversations across the dis disciplines involved in AI. I think because we've had some really fantastic breakthroughs computationally, it, we've kind of run away with it in terms of the software and the computer science side. We're now almost reining back in a bit more into the social sciences side and the cognitive science side. So, well, hang on a sec. Um, it's great that we can throw massive amounts of data and we can do all this crunching, but we're using actually a, a model. We, we still don't yet have the same level of, statistics, of, of rigor that we apply to traditional statistics, say. So, I mean, traditional statistics is a very, very established field. It's got very established ways of measuring it, of reporting the results, of reporting the confidence of the results and so forth. And we haven't actually, we, we forget that we're still actually at the early days of this industry, and we haven't yet established that level of rigor in how we present the results from all these different algorithms. Thanks. You're welcome. Brilliant, thanks Maggie. We've got time for one final question. Uh, Jay, if you'd like to read yours out. Hi, um, just in relation to what you and Sue were talking about, I just wondered whether face masks are making it more difficult for us to be recognised. Um, I think it certainly does with all the algorithms trained before face masks. Um, I don't know about anyone else, I certainly remember getting when I my iOS updated, one of the update notes on the thing was um, improved uh, unlocking face ID if wearing a mask. So they're obviously uh, 
ramped up the detail at the top half of your head, I presume they're just doing a much higher resolution so as to not even bother with what's covered by the mask. So, but that's for unlocking a screen. I mean, there's some fascinating research that's been published on how to fool these facial recognition and well, visual vision recognition ones. There's, you can wear clothes with certain patterns, um, glasses with literally just a certain pattern around the frame and boof, it'll go and suddenly classify you as somebody else entirely. Um, so there's, and, and I think that's good. And it's, um, Alistair earlier was mentioned as an artist. I think this is where we're really dependent on our sort of hacker artists and activists, citizen activists, because by playing around with these capabilities, it's good because it makes us aware of how it's being used. But also we need to think about, you know, where's the privacy here? Where's our, where's our choice? in how much we're being monitored. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Um, I think we need to round this up now. So um, thank you again so much, Sharon, for such an excellent talk. And um, thank you to the audience for your great questions and for joining us today. Um, please come back next week. Uh, we've got another Sharon who is CEO of Kruasis, um, and she will be sharing how Fortune 500 com companies can use the data they already have before investing in new data collection. Um, have a lovely weekend, everybody. Thanks, everyone.